Hi, I'm Seamus McGran, and I want to welcome you all to the Hampton History Museum Front Porch Music Series, which is going to you virtually tonight. As much as we'd like to have you all here in the Great Hall, we're just unable to do that right now. But without any social distancing, we're going to bring you some great music tonight and a great bit of history with our friend David Gardner. And some of you may have heard David here um, perform before. Uh, he's an expert and a specialist uh, nationally known on the Scottish fiddle. And he's been performing since the 1980s. And he's gone on to also teach and judge Scottish fiddle. So he knows his stuff. So he's going to be not just performing, but telling you a little bit about the history um, and uh, give you a bigger um, picture of how this music has really um, shaped the music we listen today and the influence that it had in colonial Virginia. Um, also tonight, I want to thank our friend from the Hampton City Channel, Hampton City Schools, uh, Randy Bagoli, for helping us with our production. And um, we also want to say this is our first time that we're using our new AV system for a music event. And with everything we're doing here these days, it's going to be a bit of an experiment. We hope it sounds great. If it doesn't, I'm sure you'll let us know, because you can just uh, send us a message in the comments. Also, if you have questions for David, please uh, let us know. And um, as he's performing here tonight, I will uh, interject from time to time with questions from the audience. We'd really love to know what you want to know about the music he's performing and how it sounds and how much you're appreciating it, because I know you will. So I'm sure uh, you'll be hearing more about David from himself. So without any further ado, I'm going to step aside and thank you very much, David, for performing tonight. Uh, Scottish music and the influence on colonial Virginia music. Thank, thank you, you, Seamus. I appreciate it. a tune called Over the Water to Charlie, a very famous tune in America, actually, in the 18th century. It was one of the most popular tunes in the 18th century in Virginia. And the way that we know that is through a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, one of the easiest ways is look at all of the different collections of music that they, um, that they were buying here in Virginia. Um, this tune was in almost every single one of those collections that we know that were bought and sold here in Virginia. And also another interesting way that we know that this particular tune was popular was through clocks. There was a, a, a fashion in the 18th century that you would get a clock and instead of chiming the hour with just a bell like you might be accustomed to, it would actually chime the bell um, with this particular tune. And if you look at the clocks actually made in America that did, that did that, the most common tune was Over the Water to Charlie. So we do know that this was a very, very popular tune. Um, we have some, uh, we, we have some information from people's diaries in the 18th century. And one of my favorite diaries to uh, quote from is actually by a fellow by the name of Philip Vickers Fithian, uh, who was a, um, he was a tutor to the Carter family on the Northern Neck between 1773 and 1774. 
And Philip v uh, Vickers Fithian said on Monday of December 13th, 1773, he said, I observe that all the merchants and shopkeepers in the sphere of my acquaintance, and I am told it is the case through the province that they are mostly young Scotchmen, several of whom I know as Cunningham, Jennings, Hamilton, and Blaine. And it's been the custom heretofore to have all of their tutors and schoolmasters from Scotland. And if you look at the, the shops in, um, in Virginia and Hampton and also in Williamsburg, if you look at the proprietor's names, three quarters of the shopkeepers, the merchants, were from Scotland. So the music was, was also very popular. So popular, in fact, that a very famous fellow from Philadelphia by name of Benjamin Franklin stated this. He said, the reason why Scotch tunes have lived so long and will probably live forever is merely this, that they are really compositions of melody and harmony united, or rather that their melody is harmony. I believe our ancestors in hearing a good song distinctly articulated sung to one of those tunes felt more real pleasure than is communicated by the generality of modern operas. So, so Benjamin Franklin was quite a fan of Scottish music. And um, you, you look at many of the other um, of, uh, luminaries of Virginia, uh, Thomas Jefferson had quite a few collections of uh, Scottish music. In fact, I'll play you one of these tunes that he, uh, that he was quite fond of in a collection. Uh, I'm going to be playing a lot of tunes from two different collections. The first collection is called The Caledonian Pocket Companion, which we know was actually sold in Williamsburg by a fellow by the name of, of um, uh, P Purdy, I believe, is it? Uh, yes, Alexander Purdy. And um, he was a printer from Scotland, a place in Scotland just southwest of Edinburgh, Scotland, Peeblesshire. And um, he was also the um, editor of the Virginia Gazette for a time. So this particular tune out of that, I think, captures what Benjamin Franklin was talking about. It's a very popular tune in the Appalachian Mountains today as well. It's a tune called Maggie Lauder. Let me play that for you. So this tune seems like a very composed piece, and that's one of the nice things about the Caledonian Pocket Companion. It's a book that starts off each one of these tunes, Maggie Lauder is a good example, where they give you the basic um, melody, and then they give you a whole slew of variations to play, which get progressively more difficult and more interesting. So not only is it a good book to uh, have, for uh, a beginning violinist, for instance. But a very accomplished violinist will enjoy the book as well. This book was so popular that there was a young lady from Alexandria, uh, Alexandria Virginia, that, um, whose father was a merchant who sailed between Alexandria and England and Scotland. 
and she asked her dad to uh, bring a copy of the Caledonian Companion, uh, Pocket Companion. It's, uh, it's in uh, eight different volumes, and she had all of the volumes except for one, so she asked him if he could possibly find that last volume, uh, and hopefully she got it. I'm not sure whether she did or not. But the next tune I'd like to play for you is a tune that we're all quite familiar with, actually. Um, another tune that, that ended up being sung by many folks in, um, in the Appalachian Mountains. Many of the Scots um, who were displaced during, the, um, during the, the various wars in Scotland um, ended up settling in the western regions of Virginia, in the, uh, in the Shenandoah Valley and uh, the Appalachian Mountains. And this tune is, um, is a tune that has sort of transformed itself in American history. Uh, but it was originally a Scottish tune. And this is the original melody for the tune. This is a tune called Barbara Allen. Such a beautiful piece of music. The next tune I'd like to play for you is actually from a comic opera. This comic opera was actually performed in Williamsburg in 1768. And we know that Thomas Jefferson actually went and saw this particular opera. Um, we know this because Thomas Jefferson pretty much never threw anything away in his papers. So he always kept copies of things and even kept the, the ticket stubs of all of the different concerts he went to. And one of these concerts was the Beggar's Opera by John Gay. And um, it's, a, it's a comic opera. And there are a bunch of different tunes. There are English tunes and also a bunch of Scottish tunes. Um, I looked at the list of tunes. And uh, out of the tunes, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least eight or nine Scottish tunes. Uh, the Bonnie Gray-Eyed Morn, O'er the Hills and Far Away, Gin Thou Weren't Mine Own th Thing, Bonnie Bonnie Broom, The Lass of Patey's Mill, Bonnie Dundee, and a version, a Scottish version of Green Sleeves. Now, I'd like to play a couple of these tunes for you. Now, this is the uh, Lass of Patey's Mill, a very pretty, uh, pretty tune for you.
now over the hills and far away. the hills and far away it's it's one of those hit songs from the from the 18th century um, whenever you go into the the taverns over um, in colonial Williamsburg and find some music and if you ask a request a lot of the people who reenact this sort of stuff they like to sing that song a lot uh, so it's a, it's a very very um, popular tune but the the interesting thing about these collections in the 18th century the um, the two collections that I'll be working out of tonight are the, um, the, like I said, the Caledonian Pocket Companion and also a tune called the Aired Collection, both of which we know was sold out of Alexander Purdy's shop in Williamsburg. Um, it not only um, preserved the music of Scotland, but there were a lot of tunes that were being written down in the Scottish uh, collections that were not necessarily Scottish. Green Sleeves is a good example, and this next tune that I'll play is another good example. Um, these tunes um, are preserved in the Scottish uh, pr um, print because if you wanted to hire a printer in the 18th century, you generally went to Scotland. Most people who were printers of that time period were coming out of Scotland in the English-speaking world. There were more there were more printing presses in Scotland in the 18th century than anywhere else in the entire world. Uh, part of it has to do with the Scottish um, Enlightenment in the, um, in the 17th century, in the 18th century. But, um, and they, did, they just didn't uh, uh, print just simple things. They printed um, sonatas and, and things like that, Very, what we would consider art music. But they also, collected a lot of the folk tunes <clears throat> of the time. And this particular one became very famous, um, supposedly, on uh, an October 19th of 1781, when the British surrendered at Yorktown. It's a tune, um, has two different titles. The one is called, um, The King Shall Enjoy His Own Again. Or a more popular title was, The World Turned Upside Down. And it's said that this particular tune was actually played at the Battle of Yorktown. And I said it's said that that happened. Uh, we don't know this for absolute certainty. Uh, the, there's only one account of it happening, and the fellow who wrote it down wrote it down about 50 years after the actual event. So um, maybe he was, uh, you know, remembering incorrectly. But this, it's a, it was a popular children's tune of the time, and um, it's the tune um, that was actually collected in the Caledonian Pocket Companion, this, this, this book. So I'll play that for you. The King Enjoys His Own Again, which was supposedly played at the Surrender at Yorktown in 1781.
the king enjoys his own again or the world turned upside down. Now, um, getting back to Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson was actually quite a fine violinist. Um, he was uh, considered one of the best uh, amateur violinists in um, not just Virginia, but also in the whole country. And, um, and this wasn't just people around him saying this. Sometimes um, during the revolution, uh, when officers were being held um, as prisoners of war, they wouldn't be stuck off in some jail somewhere. They were generally um, put up in, in people's households, uh, and they were treated quite well. And um, there was a, um, a German fellow who was actually quartered with Jefferson, and he described Jefferson as as good as any any um, accomplished violinist in, in Europe at the time. So he was, it was high praise. And when he left, he left Jefferson with a collection of music, which, is, which was quite a, um, he, he realized that Jefferson loved, loved printed music. But Jefferson um, loved his, his violin playing. There was a, uh, back when he was a, a student at the College of William and Mary, um, back in the 1760s, um, in the Christmas of, uh, of 1760, he stayed with Colonel Nathaniel Dandridge in Hanover County, and he met a fellow violinist by name of Patrick Henry. So I just always imagine their first meeting was over uh, the violin they were playing together. And um, Jefferson was quite an avid um, letter writer in his lifetime, and he wrote many letters, and one of the letters he wrote to a best friend of his by the name of Dabney Carr, who's um, buried up at the, at the mountain of Monticello. Um, and he, it was a conversation with Dabney Carr about their favorite music. And in one of the letters, Jefferson stated that my favorite tune is the Scottish air, the Flowers of Edinburgh. So let me play that tune for you, the Flowers of Edinburgh. It's considered a country dance in Scotland. <laughs> can certainly see why Jefferson loved that tune. It's, it's one of my favorites as well. It just kind of goes along quite nicely. Um, this next tune is, is, um, is a beautiful, beautiful air called Rosalind Castle. And it has some roots in Freemasonry. If you're ever in Scotland uh, and go to uh, Rosalind Castle, there's a chapel there that has a lot of Masonic um, imagery in it. And one of the most famous Freemasons in American history was George Washington. And George Washington, when he passed away, he wanted to have a tune played at his funeral. So the tune that, that he chose and uh, asked for um, his, his wife Martha to make sure that they actually would play at his funeral was this tune. It's called Rosalind Castle. 
and um, it's it's a hauntingly sad tune. But it's um, if um, if you ever are in a in a ever see a Masonic funeral, sometimes they'll play this tune as well in honor of George Washington. Now, during his lifetime, a particular version of a, um, of a march was actually played for Washington as well. And this was written down um, and became very popular. But the very earliest publication date of this particular tune was in the James Aird collection of 1782. And it's called General Washington's March. So this tune was actually published in Scotland before it was published in America. And it became very popular. The particular uh, collection was very popular in America, as I said. So, so this particular um, tune was written here in America, crossed the ocean, was written down in Glasgow, printed on a piece of paper, and brought right back to America in the space of about a year, which is pretty impressive if you think about it. So here's General Washington's March. General Washington's March. Now, um, if you look at Thomas Jefferson's papers, there is a really wonderful little uh, handwritten booklet that um, was actually written, um, written down by Thomas Jefferson's granddaughter, Virginia J. Randolph. And um, it was uh, Jefferson's um, habit to make sure that his family was well educated and part of their education was that they were to play music several hours a day. And also apparently one of Virginia's um, assignments from granddad was to copy various pieces of music down in, on manuscript paper. And uh, one of those tunes is a Scottish tune. It's uh, actually two of those tunes are Scottish tunes. One's called Duncan Gray. It's a uh, uh, variations of Duncan Gray, and another one is called Rural Felicity, which also has a different name as well. It's called Haste to the Wedding, so I'll play those two tunes for you.
Duncan Gray and rural Felicity. Now, sometimes what would happen is they would take tunes that were already known and uh, people knew the names of the tunes and they, they sort of co-opted these tunes. A good example of that would be our national anthem, actually. Uh, our national anthem started off as a drinking song um, in, um, in England at the time. And then we liked the melody so much that we started putting um, words to it that were more appropriate for, for our story. So, so what happened in, uh, in 1814 when, um, when Francis Scott Key wrote that poem, he already had a melody in mind and it was, it was, a, it was an English tune. So, so that was uh, that particular tune called To Anacreon in Heaven. But another one of these tunes that sort of had a similar uh, situation happen to it um, is they would take these, these known tunes and change the names or put different words to them. And these ended up being called liberty songs. And there's, there's a particular one in here in the, in the Aird Collection published in 1781. The original name in the Aird Collection is actually called the Gobio. Um, and in the tune, uh, in, in it, it actually says it's an Irish tune. Um, I've actually never found it in any Irish sources. Most of the um, Irish tunes also, this is, this is an interesting fact, is that many of the earliest publications of Irish music was in Scottish sources because there just weren't that many uh, printers in Ireland at the time. In Ireland, it was more of an oral tradition than in, um, than in other parts of the world. So the Scots were some of the first even to write down Irish music. Um, so the Gobio was a very popular tune in the 1780s. But during the revolution, it kind of got a different name. They called the tune Jefferson and Liberty. So here's the tune, the Gobio or Jefferson and Liberty. Jefferson and Liberty. Now, um, another couple of tunes that, that we really need to be talking about, and these are very, very um, important tunes. And um, they, are, they are tunes that were preserved by the African American population. Many of the, uh, of the enslaved population were quite musical folks. In fact, um, Jefferson tended to hire, uh, to hire. He, he tended to um, acquire slaves who already had skills that they could, they could play musical instruments. And um, in fact, one of, one of his, um, his enslaved population actually um, was, was quite an accomplished fiddle player. And after Jefferson died, um, when, this, when this fellow was in his, probably in his 80s, now this was in the 19th century, probably in the middle of the 19th century, when he was actually, um, he was um, interviewed. And they a were asking him all sorts of questions about his life at Monticello. And he said that he was 
often called to, to play for, for dances and things like that. So there's an account in the Fithian, um, in the Fithian diary that talks about a similar situation. He said, this evening, the Negroes collected themselves into the schoolroom and began to play the fiddle and dance. Seven Negroes and Ben and Harry, those were the sons of, of, of Robert Carter, are playing the banjo and dancing. And in this interview, this, um, this slave of, of Jefferson's was, um, was asked, what, well, what was one of the tunes you liked to play? And it's interesting what he said. He said, oh, one of my favorite tunes, and Master Jefferson taught me this tune, was a tune called Money Musk. And Money Musk is a Scottish tune. It's not just any Scottish tune. It's a type of t a Scottish tune called a Strathspey. I'll play Money Musk for you. There was another type of tune, though, that was uh, almost lost to history if it weren't for this Scottish collection, the Aird Collection. And it is a type of uh, a tune called a Negro Jig. And a lot, of the, um, a lot of the diaries of the time talk about um, the slaves playing these tunes. And there was a t particular type of tune that they called the Negro Jig. And it was apparently sort of a, a, a cross-blending of African-style music and, um, and Scottish music. And the only version of a, um, of a Negro jig that survives to this day is because of the Scottish publication, the Aird Collection from 1781. I've never, I've, I've looked through so many different sources, and this is the only one remaining that I have ever been able to find and it's called Pompey Ran Away. So I'll play that one first, and that's the Negro Jig. And there are two other tunes in the same collection that are interesting as well. It's a tune called Sam Jones and Old Plantation Girls. And usually after these they say, you know, Strathspey, real, but this particular type of tune is called a Virginian. So people often ask me, what, are, well, what does a Virginia real sound like? Well, these are probably what they were talking about. The Sam Jones is a Virginian and Old Plantation Girls. It's interesting though because they're in two different meters. Sam Jones is in common time and um, Old Plantation Girls is actually in an unusual time signature. It's in 9-8. So I'll play um, Pompey Ran Away, the Negro Jig, followed by two Virginia tunes called Sam Jones and Old Plantation Girls. <laughs>
that's a couple of Virginia tunes that were preserved by, uh, by the Scots um, back in the 18th century. So if you folks have any questions that you might have, um, you can put them down in the comment area, and um, Seamus will come over and ask them for you because I can't really see the I can't see the screen. But um, but if you've got any questions about the tunes or the the historical sources that I'm working from or any of this this information, I'd be happy to share some information with you. And if I don't know the answer, I can always look it up and let you know what I find out. You got anything for us, Seamus? We do have a question. What's that? Um, Well, um, the, uh, what I'll end up doing is I'll, I'll um, actually give you a link for both of these collections. Um, and um, I hope you have plenty of time to look at these tunes because there's a lot of really great tunes. Um, the uh, Caledonian Pocket Companion has eight volumes and um, the uh, Aired Collection has, I believe, five volumes. And um, they're located in a wonderful free source called imslp.com. And um, you can find them there, but I'll, I'll make sure I, I uh, leave a link for everybody. Any other questions that we have? Not so far. OK. Well, I wanted to tell you one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite quotations from the 18th century in the Fithian um, manuscript. And it's on Thursday, August 25th of 1774. So we're getting about the right time of the year here. And it's, um, he said, still stormy. The gentlemen who are sailing up the bay to the Congress have a disagreeable time. This is a true August Northeaster, as we call it in Cohansey. Ben is in a wonderful fluster, lest he have no company tomorrow at the dance. But blow high, blow low, he need not be afraid. Virginians are of genuine blood. They will dance or die. That is one of my favorite <laughs> quotations from the time period. Thomas Jefferson was a fine dancer. He, um, he actually spent a lot of time and a lot of money learning how to dance. And uh, that was part of the, um, the education of a gentleman in the 18th century was how to learn how to dance and how to fence. And those are considered your, um, your courtesies. And if you didn't know how to dance or, um, or, or fence back then, yeah, yeah, you you weren't gonna have any good suitors, so um, so this um, yes, so he was quite a good dancer, and actually he had um, in in his um, in his memo books where he kept all of his uh, all of his um, money tallied, he never he never reconciled his checkbook unfortunately, but but he always wrote down what he spent. Um, there's a whole bunch of listings of paying dancing masters, so yes, he was quite a good dancer. We got even more. Uh, that's it for right at the okay, moment. Okay, so let me play one of these popular dance tunes. This is a hornpipe. Hornpipes became popular among sailors, not because they necessarily liked to dance, but because the the navy liked to make them dance so they they would stay physically fit because they thought that sailors who were physically fit would not get scurvy. Well, they were wrong about that. They 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 ended up having a whole bunch of cardiovascularly fit sailors with scurvy. But, um, so this tune, and I always thought this was a relatively modern tune and until I found it in the Aired Collection, it's a tune called the Staten Island Hornpipe. It's a very popular dance tune of the time. <laughs>
Allen Hornpipe. <laughs> a lot of the tunes that we know of from uh, what we consider um, like Appalachian tunes, old time tunes, a lot of them are Scottish. Um, and you can find them in, in some very old sources. One of the most popular couple of tunes that were considered to be, um, um, we, we always think of them as being an American tunes, are a, a group of three tunes. It's a, a tune called The Soldier's Joy, a tune called um, The Devil's Dream, which is the more modern name for it, but they ended up, in the 18th century, they called it The Devil Among the Tailors, or The Deal Among the Tailors, and a tune called The Mason's Apron. So I can play those those tunes for you. questions. Um, one from Margaret Anthony. She wants to know if you've ever worked with Clay Jenkinson of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I've never worked with him. I have actually, I have met him and had a few conversations with him, uh, trying to keep him honest sometimes about music, uh, since that's sort of my thing. Um, I've, I've been wanting him to change his, uh, I've been wanting him to change his, his, um, his theme song at the beginning of his, uh, his, his show because it's a, it's a piece by Bach, which is very popular now, but Bach was kind of old fashioned and not many people really listened to him. And Jefferson did own Bach, but not Johann Sebastian Bach. He actually owned pieces by Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, which would, was actually the popular Bach of the time. So um, I've, been, uh, I've, I've given Clay some, some, uh, some zingers sometimes just to, and he, he, he laughs. <laughs> Interesting. And um, Barry Davis wants to know if these tunes have an influence on the development of bluegrass music. Absolutely. Um, the, the sort of direction that comes from bluegrass, people don't realize how new bluegrass is. The fellow who developed bluegrass was Bill Monroe, who only died about a decade ago. 
and, um, and Bill Monroe um, took the elements of old time music, which is the music from the Appalachians, and he, he sort of codified the, the group of instruments that we use today in bluegrass music, with, which would be a guitar, a mandolin, a fiddle, and a bass, and of course a banjo. And those are, those are sort of, you gotta have those instruments to have bluegrass. And so it came out of the old time fashion, uh, which came directly out of the Scottish. So it's, there's, it's sort of two, two times removed from, uh, from Scottish. Well, and on that line, um, uh, a mutual friend of uh, both of ours, Christopher Peters, um, wants to know, uh, did the Scots bring any other instruments to Virginia or influence the music played on other instruments in Virginia? Well, we do know that the, f the fiddle was the most popular instrument in the 18th century. Um, the, the thing about the fiddle was that it was, it was not only played by one class of people. There are certain instruments that were played by just uh, certain classes. A flute was considered a very upper class instrument. Um, the, the fiddle was actually played, like I said before, by, by gentlemen, the governor um, of, of Virginia played the violin, and also Jefferson's slaves played the violin. So it, it was one of those instruments that was not um, sort of class specific. We do know that Governor Dunmore had a piper, a fellow with, that played the bagpipes here in Williamsburg. Um, some say that that might have been one of the causes of the American Revolution, <laughs> was, the, was the piper. Um, I kid you. Um, but, um, but as for other musical instruments um, that we think of as Appalachian instruments, we think of dulcimers and things like that, the, those were actually brought over by the Germans. Uh, that was a German instrument, the uh, hammer dulcimer and also the lap dulcimer that we think of as an Appalachian instrument. Banjos were actually an African instrument. Um, they were brought over from Africa by the, by the slaves. And uh, maybe one more question before uh, you close us out. And um, uh, from uh, uh, Connolly wants to know, are the Finian references from Philip Victor, Vickers' Finian Journal Diary? I read if there, uh, years ago, and as I recall, Finian did not dance, though he remarked frequently about the importance of dancing in Virginia society in the 1700s. As Absolutely. I recall. That is true. He was actually a, a seminarian. He was, um, he, he was a, a, um, studying for the ministry. And um, he was studying at a little college up in, um, up in New Jersey, um, place Princeton or something like that. Um, and um, he did mention quite frequently that the, um, that the Virginians were different than the, than the New Jerseyans. They, they tended to curse more, they were more colorful, and they, his, um, his quotation there that they were, the Virginians were of genuine blood, that they would dance or die. And he's describing this because they, they were in the middle of one of our summer thunderstorms. And, you know, th they didn't care. They were going to go through that, that thunderstorm to get to a dance. So, well, I think our hour has passed. So um, I think that I'll play one more tune. And um, this is, a, this is a, 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 a tune called uh, Highland Whiskey, which I think is a, is a good way to finish off an evening. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Uh, it's been delightful. I hope you all have enjoyed this evening. Um, please uh, check uh, David out online. 
and um, uh, see what other events might be coming up soon. If you came in late or um, if you just want to watch again, I'm going to be posting this, of course, on Facebook. You'll be able to find it on our uh, YouTube playlist again very soon uh, that you can share hither and yon. And um, we'd love to see you back. Please keep uh, in touch with us via Facebook. Our next upcoming events, not just uh, programs like this, but other lectures. Um, we've got some great uh, educational videos and more that you can find under our video tab. Again, thank you very much. I'm Seamus McGran, and I wish you all a very fine evening. Thank you.